Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his right ear. And the name of the servant was Malchus. The scene of the Passion takes place in the garden immediately after the kiss of the traitor Judas. With this horrible betrayal, things suddenly go bad for the apostles. Filled with enthusiasm from Palm Sunday, renewed at their ordination to the priesthood, the bishopric, participating in the first Holy Mass, the Last Supper, and receiving the intimate embrace of our blessed Lord in Holy Communion, with him even washing their feet, the apostles must have thought they were invincible. Oh, how our blessed Lord must have glowed at this first Holy Mass. With desire, he said, I have desired to eat this Pasch with you before I suffer. All the warnings of the impending arrest, the trial, the scourging, the suffering, and death fell on deaf ears and seemed impossible for one so filled with light, so filled with power and love. All this week, His Majesty had befuddled the elders and scribes and their guards time and time again. He spoke of things of time and eternity of church and state, of heaven and hell. He was unstoppable. He was unbeatable. He was irrefutable. He was untouchable. Who would dare to cause him any harm? Surely this garden would open the way back to that other lost garden of paradise. When we hear of prophecies yet to be fulfilled, do we not feel the same wonder? How will this be? How is this possible? When we hear of the prophecies of our time, think of the people's response to the destruction of the Jerusalem and its temple. It seemed incredible. How could it possibly come down? Thus, instead of praying and preparing for the spiritual battle that lay before them, the apostles fell into arguing amongst themselves as to who was the greatest and who would do what in the kingdom that seemed to be unfolding in their presence. Or they just daydreamed and fell asleep. Here is the misstep. They failed to pray properly. Ah, if only they had entered into the Holy Mass more deeply when they had the chance. The Mass, the Mass, the Last Supper, was the work God the Father had sent the Son to complete. Even before Calvary, he said, I have completed the work you've given to me. This is the work. The lamb had been slain from the foundation of the world before their very eyes for the first time. Now it was too late. Here before them stood his majesty, having prayed the longer, now soaked with blood and sweat, being kissed by one of their own. And to think this wicked man had just received Holy Communion himself, had just been ordained. They witnessed the most infamous betrayal in the history of the world. Right before their very eyes, our blessed Lord was being arrested. He did not pass through their midst. Could it be that he was stoppable after all? How is this possible? They're stopping him. They're beating him. He's able to be held and bound. Something different is going on here. What to do? Peter, the first pope, head of the apostolic college, takes up the sword to defend his majesty, striking wildly and all alone at the enemy. And they were many. Here is a lesson. There is obviously some self-sacrifice here in Peter. But the wrong kind. In a normal battle, he would have been cut down very quickly. 
He acted not according to God's ways, but man's, and thus failed. It was like Moses killing the Egyptian all over again. Thus, his majesty's rebuke, Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put up thy sword into the scabbard. The chalice which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? I will show you how to gain the victory, Peter. Follow me. We will gain the victory by way of wood, not swords. And all who chase, all who choose the natural and worldly paths to stop evil will not solve it. This is a spiritual war that requires a victory on higher levels. Spiritual weaponry is required. Thus, His Majesty stated, All that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinketh thou that I cannot ask my father, and he will give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? Although Judas in his malice and treachery has more, many more followers than Christ, we need not fear. The supernatural power of God will always gain the victory, always, always. In the time of the prophet Isaiah, this Assyrian king Sennacherib came and surrounded Jerusalem under King Ezekias. The scripture tells us, And the angel of the Lord went out and slew in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And they arose in the morning, and behold, they were all dead corpses. 185,000 surrounding Jerusalem, no more. Numbers mean nothing in this war. On the other hand, how we pray, how we suffer, what we offer to God on the cross can make all the difference in the world. The apostles failed to pray. They did not negotiate the victory with God the Father when they had the chance when they attended the first Mass. And finally, let's turn to the sword that Peter wielded. Since our battles are first and foremost spiritual, as Sennacherib learned the hard way, we can see that this sword symbolizes higher things. First, the sword of the angel protecting the paradise comes to mind. The apostles were thinking the door was opening to Eden. The kingdom was going to be ushered in. Paradise was in the offing. But then comes the sword that draws blood and stops ears from hearing. Instead of entering into the kingdom, they end up fleeing for their very lives. How many movements over the centuries promise paradise on earth and end in blood, an ocean of blood? in deafness to God's ways and just more and more divisions. There's a sword protecting paradise. Second, very relevant to us is this, a second. The sword is the truth, the very word of God. Notice it was wielded by Peter, the first pope, custodian and preserver of truth. This sword is spoken of by St. John and St. Paul. Take unto you the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, says St. Paul. And from the Apocalypse, from his mouth came out a sharp two-edged sword. And again from St. Paul. For the word of God is living and effectual, and more piercing than any two-edged sword, and reaching unto the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints also in the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The spiritual sword must be used in accord with God's holy will, that is, with charity and humility. If we do not do this, we will easily strike off the ear of our listeners, making them deaf to the good, the word of God, the truth offers them, salvation. I think traditional-minded Catholics and various blog sites do this all the time. 
lop off the ears of their listeners, in other words. They hit hard with truths of the faith, but in a way that is not filled with charity, not filled with meekness and humility of Christ. They end up lopping off the ears of their listeners, requiring a miracle of grace to convert these people. How many of us have had this experience? Good intentions, true. Efforts to clear our conscience are not enough. It has to be done as God wills. Like Peter, swinging those sword wildly and not with any lasting effects, saving souls, in other words. So do these people do. So think about it. From the gospel, our Lord seemed to side. It's a very interesting scene in the gospel. He seemed to side with his enemies by working his last miracle of healing upon one of their number. Let us therefore form habits of prayer and meditation of negotiating with his majesty on the wood of the cross at the mass. We will not easily betray him or his holy cause, and we will more readily and effectively wield the sword of truth to save souls for him. But there's still more, maybe a little more painful use of the sword. Keeping with our theme today that we're under a passion, and it's here present in our parish even, we're under the gun, as it were. We're under the sword. This sword also represents the need for detachment, a cutting away of everything of the world, the flesh and the devil, a cutting away of anything that prevents us from a flight up to heaven. We might use other words, namely that the apostles were in a need of rejection spirituality. And even, if I may use the term, rejection therapy. They needed to let go of the worldly baggage, the worldly ideas that they had imbibed. Thus, if you want to read about rejection spirituality, rejection therapy, we can read the book of Job. We can read Psalm 87, which is the psalm used for Saturday Night Compline. We can read the life of St. John of the Cross or St. Benedict Joseph Labre. These are examples. Or a victim soul like Leidwin. God gives us many, many good things in this life. But the best thing he gives us are the spiritual goods. But even these are only meant to unite us more closely to him, at least most of them. Not all of them. All of them are going to keep us united. I mean, some of them. A lot of them are not. I'll give you an example. St. John of the Cross explains that when God gives us consolations, he gives us locutions maybe, a touch, a vision, whatever, all being very good and coming from God, St. John of the Cross instructs us to be safe. We have to reject them. And God will not be offended because by doing so, we want God himself, not the gifts. God then gives back even higher gifts, better gifts. That's the amazing part. I think we're under a rejection therapy now. We're tempted to cling on to the goods that God has given us. And it's true, we need to cling but it may come a time in which we have to let go and not seek it out of due order and trust in God like a Job on a dunghill. We find it hard to do this, so God makes us do it. This is the scary part. Thus, we have rejection spirituality. We have rejection therapy. Study the stations of the cross. We are crushed, the worldly ways fail, and we are forced to cling to what is left. God himself, in faith, hope, and charity, 
That's what the victim souls did. That's what Job did. And the apostles failed at first to do this. They fled. They clinged to the consolations. Only the beloved apostle made it to the heights of Calvary with the Blessed Mother and the Holy Women. We have many things given us by God on the inside. We have powers of reason and our imagination. We have all these goods that God's given us, our talents. On the outside, we have loved ones, loved things and places, things of beauty and wonder in this world. Nature has many wonders that are very lovable. Saints rejected them by going off into the desert, walling themselves up in some cave, entering a cloister for life to show us what voluntary rejection looks like. That even the most beautiful things, as it were, must be quote-unquote rejected for God's sake. And he will give us greater ones. We can ask why God gives us so many beautiful things. At first, all of these are useful in serving God. But due to our fallen nature, we easily become distracted. So no matter what, in due time, they all must be set aside. This is what death does or made to serve God alone and their beauty sacrificed. Why did God give us these things? Ultimately, to sacrifice them to his blood. To sacrifice the excellences of ourselves. To sacrifice the excellences of the world. Until nothing remains and we're naked upon the cross. And then God will give us something much, much better, much more beautiful, much more, more precious. And then all that we sacrificed, this is the beauty of God. This is what Job is telling us, that all that we sacrificed will be given back in a higher way that will not deflect or distract us from union with the very principle of our being. Eternal bliss of divine union with the creator of all beauty will then be ours.